Okay, sorry for this. Hi, Ayman. Sorry for this. We had an issue with the internet connection. I'm waiting for more people to join it, to join this talk. Okay. Hi, hi everyone. I'm gonna see if Dr. Said is here so I can add him now. Okay, finally it's working. Okay. Yes, it's fine. Does that work? Perfect. Okay, I'm sorry, uh, technology isn't always as it seems. It's good that we have you, Dr. Saeed. I want to just uh, start with a brief introduction. I introduced you before, but I'll do it again briefly to the people that join me now. That join me now. Idea. Um, most people know you, but um, just a quick brief. Dr. Saeed the founder and president of Nasser Saidi and Associates. He is the former chief of the DIFC. Dr. Saidi is also a member of a regional advisory group for MENA and co-chair of OECD MENA Corporate Governance Working Group. He has been named one of the most influential Arabs several times and by several renowned magazines. Dr. Saidi is former minister of economy and trade Lebanon, in Lebanon and former Minister of Industry in Lebanon. He also occupied the position of Vice, uh, Vice Governor for two consecutive months. Dr. Saiki is with us today with active role, observations, and recommendations on all matters related to Lebanon. So our objective today is to tackle the issues related to the Lebanese economy, the crisis, how we reach here, doctor, and whether there is still hope of rescue. So, doctor, I want to stand up to start with today, uh, where we stand. We had, today we see the negotiations with the IMF, they are put on hold because of the agreement between the banking sector and the government on a unified plan, unified numbers. We've seen that not a single reform, reform today has been implemented, and uh, the lira has become worse. Hyperinflation is here. Poverty uh, has reached a dramatic level. We are at 50%, and even the World Bank is expecting the poverty rate to increase maybe to 75%. You described Lebanon as a failed state, doctor. Can you briefly tell us why did we reach here? Well, of course, um, Lebanon is facing the results of decades of gross economic mismanagement. Large fiscal deficits in excess of 10% of GDP over the past decade, more than 10% of GDP, so that accumulated debt. Then you had a large current account deficit in excess of 20% of GDP. That meant that you were importing from the rest of the world much less than you were exporting to the rest of the world. Even the large remittances that we got from the rest of the world, from our expatriates, Lebanese all over, were not sufficient. Net result of all this, you had to finance the budget deficit, you finance the budget deficits, you finance the current account. The result of that is a large accumulation of debt. The IMF is projecting that we're going to reach more than 183% of GDP in debt for 2020. That's the third highest in the world. At the same time, if you look at the current account, one of the main reasons why we ran very large deficits is because our Lebanese pound was overvalued. The real exchange rate was overvalued. That made imports much cheaper to us and made our exports much more expensive. That has meant that as the crisis happened starting in, in October, the Lebanese pound could no longer be supported because the central bank ran out of reserves. The central bank had kept interest rates very high in order to accumulate reserves to continue protecting the Lebanese pound. Mm 
But that was a losing battle. And starting in 2015, when remittances started slowing down from the rest of the world, the central bank started what has been called financial engineering operations. This is a fancy term to say, I'm going to borrow at increasingly higher rates. But that borrowing came via the Lebanese banks. The Lebanese banks got attracted by the high interest rates that the central bank was paying. The banks then promised Lebanese expatriates and the Lebanese in general to put their deposits with them because of the high rates. And all of that went to finance government. Well, government in the meantime used the money not for investing in infrastructure or assets or building capital in Lebanon, but for current spending. Eventually, when the remittances started declining, the inflow of deposits from the rest of the world started declining, the central bank kept on raising interest rates. But eventually the bank said, well, this sounds a bit too much, no longer credible. And they stopped doing so. And the rest of the world stopped doing so. We had basically in 2019 what we call a sudden stop. There were no longer inflows of capital and the central bank used its reserves. And the pound therefore was no longer supported. And we are into the situation we are in now that you described. A, a, collapse, a collapse of the pound and accompanying, accompanying inflation where we're reaching potentially hyperinflation. Let's say we, um, we let go of the peg in 2016. Would this yeah. have solved our problems today or would have been in the same situation? Well, I think we would have had less of a problem always when you peg, you need to make sure that fiscal policy is sustainable and can sustain the peg. You cannot have at the same time large fiscal deficits, an open current account and a pegged exchange rate. That does not work. One, you can only have two of them at the same time. What should have been done back in 2015 was to say, we can no longer maintain the peg. Let's move to more flexible exchange rates that would have avoided the catastrophe we find ourselves in today. In effect, Lebanon and the central bank have been running a Ponzi scheme. And that Ponzi scheme has now burst and we're now paying the price. Indeed, we are the price, the price today. Uh, Doctor, you compared Lebanon's political and economic crisis to that of Venezuela, calling, it, calling Lebanon Libazuela. Do you see the Venezuelan, Venezuelan case happening in Lebanon and why? There's not exactly a strict comparison. That's why I called it Libazuela. Mm -hmm. But if you, look at, if you look at the combination of what we have, very high inflation rates, high unemployment rates, high poverty rates, and in addition to what you mentioned, not only are we going to reach potentially 75% of the population poor, we have already 25% of the population food poor. That is, they may no longer able to feed themselves. That is incredible. And we're heading therefore towards famine. We have not had that since 1918. Since 1918. In addition to that, if you look at Venezuela, you have critical shortages of goods, fuel, medicines, drugs and other. That's starting already in Lebanon. We already have that. So chronic shortages. Then you've got corruption, another feature, another characteristic of Venezuela, political corruption at a very large scale. You have company closures and bankruptcies, and you're heading towards more authoritarianism in terms of government. We're already seeing government using the security forces to quell protesters. That's exactly what you see in Venezuela continuously all the time. And of course, the bottom line is that you've had gross economic mismanagement for decades in, since Cuba Chavez in Venezuela. And that's exactly what you have here. That's why I've compared it to Libazuela. But unfortunately, we may be heading not only towards a Libazuela, we may be heading towards becoming truly a failed state, as I, as I had mentioned. Uh, we're going to become 
very much like many countries in our neighborhood. Following exactly what they are doing, our neighbors, a catastrophe unfolding in front of our eyes. So, Doctor, today we are facing a catastrophic scenario, as you said it. What can, how can Lebanon be rescued if Lebanon can still be rescued today? Well, this is where I think the, I need to strike a note of optimism. I know anybody living in Lebanon who goes out into the streets now sees people rummaging through rubbish to find some food or something to eat. So it is easy to despair. I think there are solutions and I'll mention them quickly. I'll list, go through them. What should be a reform and rescue package for Lebanon? So let me systematically go through them and then we, we can pick on, on any part of them. Of course. And it's important that to say that this is achievable if there is political will. So you might tell me the political will is not there. Well, then we need to revolt and go down into the streets as we did back in September and October, if it does not happen. But here's the reform and rescue program. The first thing that you need is to have a national macroeconomic, fiscal, financial, banking reform program. I call it an economic stabilization and liquidity fund has to be put in place. The size of that fund is about 25 to $30 billion. To be specific, and I know this is, we, we are on Instagram, this is not technical, so we won't enter into too many technicalities. But let me say where we can get that money, because people will say that looks like a large amount of money, and it is. Mm -hmm. We can expect to get, if we negotiate seriously and credibly with the IMF, something like $8 billion from the IMF. From the countries that participated in SED, we can get about $12 billion. But it would be a new SEDR program, not the SEDR program that was discussed previously. Then you need to have some central bank, some central bank swaps, i.e. you have an arrangement with other central banks so that you give them your currency, they will give you, they will give you their currency. This could be with the Gulf countries, with the European countries, simply allowing you to have a facility, a swap between the central banks. I estimate we need about 5 billion. In addition to that, you, in addition to that, you need about 5 billion in trade facilities, financing trade. That's critically important for the private sector. This is something that we can do with the European countries, but also with the Arab Monetary Fund, which does a lot of trade financing. So if you look at that total, that comes out to around 25 to 30 billion. That is feasible, but of course, it has at its core an IMF program with a lot of conditionality. Well, what sort of conditionality are we talking about? And this is the second bit. The second bit is fiscal reform. That means restructuring the public sector. It means structural reforms, such as restructuring the Electricité du Liban, mm -hmm. Odero, and other, water, and other ports, airports, and, and the rest. And I'll come back to that in a minute. You also need to get rid of the many ghost workers that we have. What do I mean by ghost workers? There are many people on the payroll of the public sector and the government in general who are either, who either died, but they're still registered. They are migrated, they're somewhere else. They're somewhere in Europe or Canada or the United States, but they still collect a salary or somebody collects a salary for them. Then there's another category who doesn't show up at work, but somebody collects a salary for them. And for there's another category who are simply always absent, but they still collect a salary. If you, I've estimated that back of the envelope, that's about 10 to 15% of the workforce of the public sector. That is at least 30 to 40,000 people who should not be paid. Easy way to do so, the Ministry of Finance tomorrow announces that I will not pay one salary or one wage, except to a person that has an account at a bank in Lebanon, that that person is alive 
that they have a contract with the government, and that they live in Lebanon at the responsibility of the bank to prove that this person is live, right? And there, and has a contract. If you do that, I can guarantee you 10 to 15% will suddenly disappear. In addition to that, you've got to do something about the cost of doing business in Lebanon for the private sector. Remember that these reforms at the end of the day need to get the engine of the private sector moving again. It's the private sector that's going to create jobs, not the public sector. We have to reduce the size of the public sector. So that means doing something about infrastructure services and the cost of doing business with government. And finally, in terms of fiscal reform, you've got to do something about pensions. We have extremely generous pensions. As you know, people in the army and security services can enter into, at a young age, at 20, work for 23, 24 years, and retire at nearly full salary for the rest of their lives. We cannot continue. We cannot afford that. That has to stop. And the so-called Silsilit al Rawatib that was passed three years ago, I called it at the time fiscal harakiri. Huh. It condemned Lebanon. So if you think of the combination of the Ponzi scheme by the central bank and the Silsilit al Rawatib, which was fiscal harakiri, that explains to you why we got here today. Third item on the agenda. It's public sector restructure, public debt restructuring. Government simply cannot pay its debt. We have over $90 billion in debt, about 30 billion in foreign currencies, euro bonds and the other, and the rest is in Lebanese pounds. Government obviously cannot pay. So that means you have to have what's called a haircut. You cut and say, I cannot pay. I can only pay, say, maximum 50%. In fact, it should be a bigger haircut, but let's say around, around 50 to 60 percent. That's one. But once you do that, it means that the banks, remember our discussion at the beginning, the banks came in and put their money with the central bank and the central bank financed government. And so they hold the debt along with the central bank. Once you say, I'm going to reduce the value of that debt by 50 to 60 percent, that's a big hit on their balance sheet. It means enormous losses. And automatically, it means you have to restructure the banking sector. What does that mean? It's a big word, but what does it mean effectively? What it means is that because of the losses, the equity of the banks has been wiped out. Equity of the banks has been wiped out because of the haircut, because government cannot pay. So what you need to do is to get the shareholders of the banks, either existing or new shareholders, to put in cash, that's one way. Second, many of the banks have subsidiaries and investments abroad. They have to sell them or shut them down and bring the money back to recapitalize their operations in Lebanon. Third, they own a lot of real estate, which they took from clients who could not pay their debts. They need to sell that real estate. Fourth, um, they also have real estate themselves that they don't really need. In today's world, banks not, don't really need the big offices and buildings and all the branches that they need. We need to go increasingly towards e-banking and, and mobile banking. So by doing so, by doing everything that I suggested, they can, you need to bring in about 20 to 25 billion into the banking sector, into the banks themselves. That is entirely feasible because the shareholders of the banks benefited from very high interest rates, as we know, and got their money out, thank you very much. It is the rest of us who are stuck in the system. We need to make sure and to give them the incentives that within this macroeconomic plan that I mentioned, that if they restructure their banks, there's benefit to them and the banks will survive. Next thing that you need to do Yes, you need but, yeah. yeah, Dr. Saidi, you said here, you mentioned 20, 25 billion should go to bank for bank restructuring. This is not the 25, 30. No, this is in, no. The total package, absolutely, you're right to ask the question. The total package is about 50 billion. 
So about 25 to 30 billion for government and the private sector that I mentioned previously. And you need 20 to 25 billion to recapitalize the banks, to make them sound again, and to be able for them to play the role of banks that is financing the private sector, not financing government. That is, oh, it's, oh, it's entirely feasible. It's entirely feasible. Remember that since last September, okay, you've had over $20 billion that left Lebanon. Yeah? Yeah. And if I look at 2019 as a total in 2020, all that money exited because everybody expected a collapse. And some of them knew it may be coming. And so they got their money out. Unfortunately, the, poor, the poorer people and the rest of us are stuck. We need to make sure that we tell the banks, you need to restructure. The other restructuring that needs to take place is the restructuring of the central bank because the central bank is also holding treasury bills and euro bonds and has lent to government. Those bonds are also have to be haircut by about 50%. That means that central bank has made enormous losses. We already know what those, approximately what those losses are. They were in excess of 50 billion in 2019. That is about the size of GDP of Lebanon in 2019 that we're talking about, $50 billion of losses. This is being admitted not just by government, but also by the IMF. And it may be larger than that because we don't know what the continuing losses are in 2020. So what you need is a major restructuring of the central bank to accompany this overall restructuring. The 50 billion is a historical first. I know of no central bank in the world in history that I know that has ever lost so much money. What does the restructuring mean? It means you insist that the central bank should not lend to government. That in fact is the money and credit code. Money and credit code is very strict. It says thou shalt not finance government except in exceptional circumstances. And if you're going to do so, you only lend 10% of average revenues in the previous three years. We've gone way beyond that. That has to stop. Second thing is you stop all quasi-fiscal operations. By quasi-fiscal, it means all the subsidies to housing, to special sectors, and other special interests. That has to stop. The central bank goes back to central banking. It does not try to play the role of government. Talking and about, doctor, you said that uh, you were um, suggesting to stop subsidies on fuel. Yes. Do you think it's, it's beneficial to do that today, noting that... Uh, let, me, let me explain, let me explain why. But let me preface that by saying that today, oil prices internationally are extremely low. They're now down to 35 to $40 per barrel, right? Okay. Now, fuel prices in Lebanon have been subsidized continuously. That adds to the subsidy of the EDL, or the Electricité du Liban. So the cost of a kilowatt through EDL is about 16 to 18 cents. And the price we pay is about eight to nine cents, right? That is continued, that's the EDL deficit, which is about one and a half, $1.52 billion per year. Now, why do, should you remove that subsidy? Number one, because we are actually not only financing our own requirements, we're financing also the smuggling of fuel going into Syria. Over the past few years, when Syria, where Syria has been under sanctions, the amount of oil and fuel and other that has been imported by Lebanon is two to three times our requirements. So much of that is not going to Lebanon. It's being smuggled elsewhere and also misused. Now, people will say, but if you raise the price, that will hurt poor people. Mm -hmm. Yes, 
but there are two things you need to do. First, you target the subsidies. If you want to help poor people, you give them money directly for themselves to spend as they wish. You don't target fuel and other which everybody uses, including the very rich. It's not the poor man who's got one room and one light bulb that benefits from the subsidy. It is all the people who got palaces all over and plenty of cars and, and other. But more important is the critical bit. Because of the subsidies, we've been running these very large deficits, which have been financed by the central bank. And that has led to inflation. And the inflation wipes out your income. So now your income is down 60, 70 percent. It's not only your income, but whatever wealth you have, and it's not just the Lebanese pounds, it's Lebanese pounds wealth and, and so-called dollar wealth has also been reduced. And so you're paying a much heavier price because you're subsidizing it through monetary financing of the deficit. So you make a small adjustment and you remove those subsidies. You give targeted subsidies to the people you want to help, but then you stop financing the deficit. And that means you don't have the inflation tax. That is the big difference. That is the big trade-off. You're trading off a very large tax, which we're paying right now, which is the inflation tax, against a small benefit from subsidies. Okay? That, that, that is an important point. Let's continue a little bit on the reforms. You need governance reforms. That means that you need the regulatory authorities of EDL, <laughs> OGERO, the Central Bank, the Banking Control Commission, the Capital Market Authority, financial regulators, all of them need to be independent regulators, right? Mm -hmm. Professional, chosen for their competence and knowledge, not chosen because they belong to some political party or are beholden to some za'im. That is critical. The bottom line always is, always in all reforms, is always about governance. So that's one part of reform. I know you're going to tell me I'm dreaming, but if we cannot dream, what's left? The other one is, in terms of structural reforms, is the creation of a national wealth fund. What do I mean by that? And I've just published a paper on this. You, 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 you can see it online. I'm going to do a story about it, this paper. I always do stories about papers. What does, what does it mean to have a national wealth fund? I'd like to see all the state-owned enterprises, and we have many of them. That means Electricité du Liban. It means the casino. It means Middle East Airlines. It means Ogero. It means the water utilities. It means the ports. It means the refineries. All that gets put into a national wealth fund. For people in Lebanon and elsewhere, they know, for example, the example of Singapore, Temasek in Singapore, which does that. All these public commercial assets, as well as land, is managed by Temasek, independently managed, professionally managed, with a board, rules and regulations, and governments. Temasek annually makes a return of 15% on its assets. On average, countries around the world which have a well-governed national wealth fund can generate 3 to 4% of GDP on those assets. 3 to 4% of GDP. So instead of raising taxes and doing all sorts of stuff, manage those public assets, those public commercial assets that you have more efficiently. We can do wonders with telecoms. We are a small open economy that is highly integrated with the rest of the world. That's where you need very efficient telecoms, right? What do we have instead of that? I get cut off. I want to, I want to have an Instagram webinar with you. Hey, it's nearly impossible. The, the sound and voice and everything else and picture are choppy. We don't need them. We should be, we should be having 5G 
in 2020. That's where we should be. So yeah. let's, manage, let's manage those SAE, SOEs independently, exactly like we were running a private equity organization. This is what many countries have done very successfully. So we need to do that. But remember what happens. See what happens if you do that. Then you cut off all the corruption. Because where has the corruption come from? The corruption is, has gone into all those state-owned and government-related enterprises. They stuffed them with people. Look at Telecom, look at Ojero, look, look at all, they're all over, right? Having them well-governed means you cut off the hands of the politicians, the corrupt politicians who have benefit, been benefiting from those assets. What is the Amlek al Bahri? These are government properties. These are government properties that have been taken over, right? Imagine if we could imagine if we could get a return on those Amlek, on those on those beach properties and seaside properties all over. That would give you an enormous income. So that's another reform plan. Now, we mentioned poverty, overall poverty and food poverty. You need to fight that. And along with the many reforms that I mentioned, you need to put in place a social safety net. What do we mean by a social safety net? Lebanon, for example, doesn't have any unemployment insurance, right? If you're unemployed, that's it. Bye-bye. Yeah? yeah, you have to depend on family, you have to depend on friends or something else. So we need to put in place a social safety net to protect the poorest part of the population, which is vast growing. The World Bank has estimated that putting together the social safety net would cost us about $800 million per year. That's much less <laughs> than what you're spending in subsidies to EDL, which just goes down the drain, right? What are you getting out? What are you getting out of EDL? A couple nothing. of hours, a couple of hours of electricity per day. Many mm. people are getting nothing, and on top of that, they have to buy electricity from a local generator, right? So you're paying twice, and you're paying twice for water. We have to stop all that. We have to stop all that. So a social safety net would ensure basic income, unemployment insurance for a majority of the poor. And it's not that costly, as I mentioned. Then, as part of the, the reforms, you've got to do something about monetary policy and exchange rate policy. As we said, monetary policy has diverted itself from what the central bank should be doing. We should move towards flexible exchange, flexible exchange rates as quickly as possible. That requires that we should have a capital control act as quickly as possible. So we've been talking about capital controls basically since October, right? Mm -hmm. That's eight, nine, nine months ago already, yeah? Nothing has happened. Then you need to ask yourself, why is it that nothing has happened on capital controls? Well, it's because it's in the interests of the people, the privileged few who have access have been able to get their money out under so-called informal capital controls. That needs to stop. But when you introduce capital controls, they should be part of an overall package. Yeah? Because if you just introduce capital controls, you just end up with the same system with a lot of corruption. If you have access to a bank, a friendly bank manager, or a friendly sarraf, or a friendly whatever, then you get your money, right? If you're, if you're not so fortunate, then you're stuck. So capital controls have to be strictly introduced within an overall program. They have to be monitored, and there has to be reporting on that, right? Okay. And on top of that, you should explain why you should persist with the capital controls. Every six months, for example, <clears throat> you should provide an explanation as to why you should continue with the capital controls. And finally, uh, along my long list, <clears throat> there are two other elements. You should have told me, well, maybe we should have started with that. But there are two which are important. I left, I left them for the rest, for the, for the end. 
One is a anti-corruption program, right? We talk a lot about that. Anti-corruption program means, sorry. Effectively means in the case of Lebanon, <clears throat> appointing a special prosecutor, not a committee, yeah? We know what the committees do. They never produce anything except reports which go into the drawers. You appoint a special prosecutor and you give the special pro prosecutor special powers to combat corruption. And then you lift banking secrecy. You cannot really dream of combating corruption with a banking secrecy law as it, as it is. They passed, they tried to pass a law on, on banking secrecy about a month ago. And at the last minute, surprise, surprise, there was an amendment, which meant that the court could not lift banking secrecy. It went back to the special investigation office at, at the central bank, which effectively meant you emptied the reform of banking secrecy from what it was meant. Mm. So you, as part of it, you also agree with other countries that want to help Lebanon, and many countries want to help Lebanon, to start a stolen asset recovery program. Now, if you read some of the press and other, they'll tell you, oh, this is going to take years, we won't get anywhere, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's not true. Many countries, including Angola recently and others, have been able to get money back. Sudan as well, right? Those are two recent examples. You need cooperation with the United Nations Drugs Agency. You need cooperation with the World Bank. And of course, with a number of countries, including the EU and the United States. Just so that people understand, when money goes out of Lebanon, it typically goes out through a message in the banking system called SWIFT, right, which says, Please transfer X amount to X, Y, Z, somewhere else. Those messages are known, are available. And they can be traced and you can know who got it. And then you have, if you have a, a proper prosecutor, and if you know if, if it's been illicit, then you can follow and track it. So there is no magic there. It can be done. You just need the willpower. But of course, you'll tell me, why should a corrupt political class want to lift banking secrecy and have a program for stolen asset recovery and an effective anti-corruption program? And you're right. <clears throat> as long as they are in power, it's, a bit, it's kind of impossible. Yes. It's, it's, it's sort of like asking them to conduct, to commit political suicide. Exactly. What but for us, but for us, for all of us who want to see reform, this has got to be part of the agenda. And the final item, of course, is to say, well, the people who got us here will not let us reform. So you're going to need early elections. We need to move, we need to move towards a third republic. And the earlier we can do that, the better. So I've just given you a little, I think about 10 point agenda package. Now, this is not dreaming. <clears throat> we have the people. We know how to do it. Um, we can get the financing. We can get the financing. But the, anybody who will give you the financing will tell you, I want to see reforms. Mm. I want to see that implemented. I want to have a government procurement law right, a government procurement law. I want a capital controls law. I want an effective lifting of banking secrecy. All those, I want good governance in, in those state-owned enterprises and in the banking and financial sector. But that, hopefully, whoever wants to give us any money will say, get those things done. But it is something we should ask for. Yeah, it, it is in our interest if we're going to rebuild Lebanon into something that has a future for our children and our grandchildren, 
then we need to enact, enact those reforms. But doctor, you see today the rate reaching 10,000 and yet people are silent. How do you explain the silence? I don't think people are silent. Uh, there's a lot of anger around and, and we know that. The protesters are there. But at the same time, what has happened, if you look at the recent protests, they've also got, um, you've got a fifth column that came in, right? Which started entering between the protesters and it became violent. This violence, I think, was intentional to discredit the protesters and anybody who wanted reform, to say that national security is under threat. As soon as you start talking about national security being under threat, that allows for all sorts of repression. But I think what has affected us also during this period is the lockdown, COVID lockdown. We've had three months of COVID lockdown and people have been forced to stay at home. So have not been able to express themselves. And finally, I think the, the protest movement um, has not been, has not shown unity. They need to move towards greater unity. They need to have one voice in order to make, to make things happen. Do you think it lacks leadership? I think there is leadership, but it is fragmented leadership. That's a very Lebanese trait, yeah? Very Lebanese characteristic. Biggest problem. However, however there are there are within the protest movement quite a few voices trying to bring people together. I, for one, I think would, would love to see a shadow government being announced. Let there be a shadow government. In most countries of the world, you have a government in power and you have a shadow government. We don't have the organized political parties that are able to do so because they too are divided between themselves. But the protest movement could put together a shadow government with competent people, each with a portfolio, and that can talk then about what sort of reforms, what sort of policy measures should be undertaken. And finally, I think, um, I think the protests are going to come back. I think they are likely to be more violent because people, when they get reduced to poverty, are going to go into social and political protest. And we've already seen crime rising. The latest reports on crime is that crime has been going up by 22%, 25% over the past few months. But unfortunately, that is likely to accelerate. And so instead of getting a peaceful transition, instead of getting reforms, I think we are likely to have a much less peaceful transition and reform. We may be very well heading towards a failed state. On that note, Dr. CNN, one month ago that Lebanon will fully collapse if officials do not start implementing reforms within 90 days. One month has since you did that interview and still nothing is achieved. Where are we heading? Unfortunately, I think we're heading towards more inflation. Let me explain the mechanism for more inflation. Part of the mechanism comes from the fact that government revenues have declined by some 40, 50%. Government can no longer borrow. Nobody's going to lend to the Lebanese government, either outside or internally. And therefore, it's getting financed by the central bank. What does it mean? What does it mean getting financed by the central bank? It means the central bank is printing Lebanese pounds to pay government deficits and increasingly government spending. What happens with that money? Well, people go out and spend the money. Government employees and whoever gets money from the government will go out and spend it. Since nobody trusts the Lebanese pound any longer, everybody is going to run after dollars, right? And that means a further depreciation of the Lebanese pound and further inflation. Everybody, money becomes like a hot potato, right? You don't want to hold it. You want to get rid of it. And that means accelerated inflation, accelerated depreciation of the Lebanese pound. So I expect, think of also um, 
what it means to be a government employee or somebody in the army or the security forces. They've seen their income decline by 60-70%. How long will they continue accepting that? I don't know. But I suspect that it's going to bite more and more strongly. How are they going to feed their families? And therefore, they're going to come around and say, I want a cost of living adjustment. What does a cost of living adjustment mean? Raising those salaries again. And how do I finance that? By printing again more money. And that means you go into a vicious cycle of inflation and exchange rate depreciation. This is where we seem to be heading if you don't have the reforms. The reforms and the financial aid as well, the bailout. Absolutely. And that's why, and that's why you need urgently the IMF program. This is the number one priority today. Some people spoke about China being an alternative to the IMF program. Is it a possibility in your opinion? I think, well, it's not only nonsense. It's also sending illusions, you know, trying to delude the Lebanese people that there's manna coming from heaven. <laughs> manna, will, manna will come from Kuwait or from Qatar or further afield from China. We no, heard it's not going to come. The Chinese, the Chinese are a country. They are well managed. If they're going to be providing anything, they will say, I will invest in your infrastructure, but I will do it myself. I will not give you one renminbi. I will not give you one renminbi. Number two, China knows the situation in Lebanon very well. Just like anybody else, every other country in the world, they know exactly what the level of corruption is. And they're going to say, I'm not going to waste my money. I'm not going to waste my taxpayer money. You undertake reforms within an IMF program or something similar to an IMF program, I will participate. And the same is true for the Gulf Cooperation Council countries. Believe me, and I'm in contact with them. I do a lot of work in the Gulf. I live between Beirut and Dubai. They are willing to help. There's a lot of countries and people who love Lebanon, not just the Lebanese. They love us. They, they, Lebanon has always meant something special to many of them. Right? But they realize correctly that if you give to Lebanon today under the current corrupt political class that we have managing the country, it will not help the country. It will just get siphoned away. So they have understood from the past. Let's, it, it, it doesn't require a lot of intelligence. We've had Paris 1, we've had Paris 2, we've had Paris 3. All of them asked for reform. Then you had said or Paris 4, right? They use the different term so that it doesn't sound like a continuation of failed policies. But in, effect, but in effect, it's failed. You didn't get any reforms. When was said, when did said happen? Back in 2018, correct? And we're still sitting around talking about the same list of reforms. We didn't do anything about electricity, and yet it's draining away one and a half, two billion dollars, right? Everybody knows that it needs reform including the Chinese. So bottom line, the Chinese and others will come in. They're damn good at infrastructure. I would also say that the GCC countries are extremely good at infrastructure. This is what they've been doing for the past 25 years. I know that, for example, the electricity and water authorities and companies and a number of GCC countries would want to come in and provide us with electricity and water. They would want to do that. They would invest, but on one condition, no corruption, mm. no side contracts, and they would do it. They will not give the money to government to do it. They will build the power plants. They will build the water plants. They will build the waste management plants. They will help us take care of pollution because there's one other crisis on top of the currency crisis, the fiscal crisis, 
the political crisis, the public death crisis, the banking crisis. It is the health crisis, the pollution that is also killing us. Why? Because of mismanagement, right? Because of the mismanagement. So we need, we need to address all that. All I'm saying, and I want to be positive again, all of these are feasible and they can be done. And on top of it, we have the people who know how to do it because we've done it in other countries. They prevent us from doing it in our own country, unfortunately. So China and others, yes, they're certainly on the agenda, would be willing to help. But as Monsieur Le Drian said in the Senate the other day, help us to help you help, help yourself for us to help you. Exactly. It's true. There is another issue, uh, Dr. Saidi, everyone is debating about is whether we should sell our gold or use it as a contractor or not do anything about it because the political class would use them as, as usual for corruption. This is, this is just a drop in the ocean, is the answer. Um, we have 9 million plus ounces of gold. Uh, yes, it's valuable to reserve assets. But if you start using it, if you liquefy it, right, and you start using it, it'll just go down the drain unless you have reforms. So it is part of an overall solution. Remember that you have to restructure the central bank. You have to restructure the, the balance sheet of the central bank. Remember, there's a big hole, those losses, right? More than 50 billion worth of losses. So if you want to have financial and monetary soundness, you need to restructure the banking sector, the commercial banks, and you need to restructure the central bank. Having the goal there is part of a restructuring plan for the central bank. So it stays there, it's part of the reserves, and then you supplement it with other resources, hopefully from the rest of the world, from the IMF, central bank swaps, and others. So certainly don't touch it. The commercial banks and others are trying to get their hands on government assets, including the gold. And that's why they propose also, let's get all those assets which the central bank holds, we will take them ourselves. That means there's a simple message there. We don't want to pay for it. We want somebody else to pay for it. Even though they made the mistakes, we did not as depositors ask the banks to deposit our money at the central bank. We did not as depositors ask the central bank to finance government. We did not ask the central bank to contravene the money and credit code and its strict limitations on government lending. Exactly. So there's no reason why we should pay. If you want to restructure, you start with the shareholders of the banks. That's what happens everywhere. You have a bail-in, you start with a bail-in. If the bail-in money is ins insufficient, then you consider other possibilities. But you have mergers and acquisitions, you consolidate the banking sector, you reduce the size of the banking sector. We certainly don't need the number of banks. For a small country like Lebanon, we don't need the number of banks that we have. But that would mean a lot of unemployment. Unemployment will increase because the banking sector in Lebanon employs around 28,000 Lebanese. That's because it's been subsidized. <laughs> it's because it's been benefiting from very high interest rates. More than 85% of the profits of the banks over the past 10 years have come from banking operations with the central bank and lending to government, not from providing credit to the private sector. And now, and here's a warning, now increasingly they are having operational losses because of the capital controls, payment restrictions, and all the rest. There are no longer any banking operations. You're not providing any credit to the bank, to, to the private sector. As a result of that, you have a credit squeeze, you have a liquidity squeeze, and you have widespread bankruptcies and companies shutting down. It also means non-performing loans of the banks are rising 
they have now well in excess of 25% of loans they've made to the private sector. And at the same time, there are no trade transactions, no letters of credit, no financing trade. This is where you make your money. So the operational losses are now rising and already the banks are starting to fire employees. We've, we've seen that and we've heard that. That'll accelerate, that'll accelerate because they, shareholders will say, I cannot accept to continue making losses. And that again says a very simple message to the banks. It says, cooperate in effecting reforms, cooperate in getting an agreement with the IMF. It's in the interests of everybody, including the interests of the banks themselves. That is the message. Because if you continue like this, operational losses and other losses are mounting. Yeah? And remember, you can no longer lend to government and you can no longer do any financial engineering. So where are the profits going to be coming from? And remember, all of those were paper profits anyway. <laughs> there wasn't anything real behind that. And the scary part is that they may not be able at a certain point to deal with, our with correspondent banks abroad. It's very dangerous. That's correct. That's already happened, though. That's already happened. Because, okay. yeah. I want to take a question here I find interesting. It's Lisa asking, why do you think, what do you think of the Raj practice of BDF and approach used that no losses were incurred, but they are future profit payments? Well, that is selling pie in the sky, to be mm -hmm. polite. There are real losses that are happening today. You have to recognize them. The so-called profits that the central bank is talking about is potential future seniorage profits. That is the difference between the cost of printing Lebanese bonds, right? It costs you maybe two or three cents to, be, to print a 100,000 note, right? So when you sell that note or it goes into circulation, you make a, a so-called profit out of that. And so what the central bank is saying, I'm going to make these future profits in the future, these profits in the future, but my losses are right now. And I cannot pay the banks. Remember that the banks have all their deposits, their foreign currency deposits are at the central bank. And the central bank cannot pay them back because it's used up all its reserves. It might have maybe 18 to 20 billion left yeah, those are part of the legal reserve requirements against foreign currency deposits that the bank has, i.e. our deposits, yeah, our deposits as, as deposits. And so it's saying, well, sometime in the future, I'll be making profits. Would you ever lend a company which is continuously losing and has a big hole in its balance sheet and tells you, well, sometime in the future, um, I'll make these paper profits uh, out of seniorage? I wouldn't. No way. No one would. Uh, doctor, I'd like to end this session and take the Q&A, but uh, the questions and answers from the market, because I see I have so many questions, so uh, I will end the session now and log in again with Dr. Saidi, so all of you can type all your questions in the new session. Early q &A. Thank you. Doctor, we will have the two minutes just to the time to log in and log uh, log out again. Okay. okay. Let's hope that let's hope the technology works. Yes, yes, it works. <laughs>